if I give them a thrill and a laugh and uh, they enjoy it or make them think, uh, then that's exactly what I want to do. Hello, David Lee. It's nice to have you over here. We see in lots of your lectures that you combine um, science and magic. So how do magic and science are connected for you? I think that magic does uh, uh, and, and science uh, do over, overlap in, in some ways. So, um, for example, in chemistry, uh, we, we draw uh, pictures of reaction mechanisms and, uh, and say these arrows go here and here and here and this is how the reactions uh, go. Uh, but magic um, sort of uh, reminds, uh, reminds us uh, that sometimes you don't always know what's uh, uh, going on. And really when we do a scientific experiment, we know what we have uh, at the start and we know what we have at the end, but we don't really know uh, uh, what's going on in between that. We can't actually see uh, the electrons moving, the atoms moving at the molecular level. And ma magic is just a useful reminder to scientists sometimes that, that we don't know exactly what's going on. And I choose to blend it in with my science in the lectures, really just to have some fun with the, uh, uh, with the audience. Um, I've sat through enough lectures in my time to want to occasionally have that hour back. Uh, and I don't want that um, uh, people have that experience in my, uh, my, my talks. I feel very privileged to have the, their, their presence for 45 minutes or an hour. And uh, uh, even if they didn't enjoy our science, which of course I hope that they do, I, I hope that they have a good time. So that's what I try and bring to the lectures. Do you prepare your magic for these lectures or um, do you yeah. use something you... Uh, yes, so uh, actually it's a funny uh, joke, ongoing joke in my group that uh, when, when we come up with a, uh, a new result or a new paper, uh, the students are very worried that it's not going to get into my talk. And I try and do bits of magic in my talk to illustrate the, um, yeah, the particular chemical points. I can give you an example if you like. Yes, please. So, um, yeah, I've, I've brought some cards with me. I'll just take my jacket off for this part so that you can see what I'm, uh, I'm doing. So, um, yeah, a lot of the work that we do um, occurs with uh, molecular ma machines where you get all kinds of transitions between um, uh, where molecules can, the positions of uh, molecules can just change uh, uh, places very, very uh, rapidly. Um, and so I have a sort of a, uh, an effect I like to use to illustrate that. Uh, this is actually based on a, uh, a card game that uh, uh, you may have seen. Lots of people cheat at cards. I'm sure you play a lot of online poker and you know that there's lots of ways of cheating uh, with that. But I discovered, and we're, we're in Dublin now, I discovered in Dublin that there's a, a card game they've invented where it's impossible to cheat. And it's called Dublin City Shuffle. And uh, I heard about that and there was a place behind this lovely convention centre where a bar, a seedy little bar, uh, and I went in there looking for this card game and sure enough some guy beckoned me over and said to me, do you want to play this game called Dublin City Shuffle? And they said it's a real easy game, there's the Ace of Clubs and this is the, uh, the money card. And then there are these three blank cards and these are just there to uh, confuse you. And he said, so very fairly, we take one of the three blank cards and we don't even have to use all the blank cards. We put one on the table and then we take the ace of clubs, which is the money card, and very fairly, we put it in the middle of the other, th uh, other cards. Then we take the top card, we put that to the bottom. The second card, we put that to the bottom. And the third card, and put that to the bottom. And the man said to me, where's the ace of clubs? I said, that's easy. I was watching really closely, so I know it's this one there. He said, the one in the middle. And I said, yes, this one here. And he said, no, no, no. He said, that's one of the blank cards. He said, the ace of clubs is the money card. That's the one on the, uh, the table. He said, look, it's a really easy game. There's the ace of clubs. This is the money card. And then there are these three blank cards, but these are just there to confuse you. So very fairly, we don't use all of the blank cards. We take one of the blank cards and we put that on the table. We take the ace of clubs, which is the money card, and we very fairly put that in the middle of the other two cards. Then we take the top card and we put that to the bottom. We take the second card and put that to the bottom. 
and we take the third card and we put that to the bottom. And he said to me, where is the ace of clubs? I said, this time I was watching really closely. This time I know it's that one there. He said, the one in the middle? I said, yes. And he said, no, no, no. He said, that's one of the blank cards. He said, the blank cards are just there to confuse. He said, the ace of clubs is the money card. That's the one on the table. So I went over and I, I bought a set of these cards and it wasn't too long before someone came into the pub and I beckoned them over and I said, do you want to play this game? Dublin City Shuffle. I said, it's a really easy game. There's the Ace of Clubs, which is the money card. And there are these three blank cards. And these are just there to confuse you. We don't even use all the blank cards. I said, we take one, very fairly, we put that on the table. We take the Ace of Clubs, we put that between the other two. We then take the top card, we put that to the bottom. Then the second card and put that to the bottom. And then the third card and put that to the bottom. And I said to the man, where's the ace of clubs? And he said, that's easy, it's the one in the middle. And I said, no, 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 it's hit. And that's when I learned, never play cards in Dublin. Because not only was the ace of clubs in the middle, but it was here and it was here as well. So <laughs> Great. <laughs> so... That's what I use just to show how um, molecular components can change places very fast and you can't always keep track of it. But it's just a bit of fun, so I hope you like that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's great. Sure, I'll take those out of the way. And um, it also um, advances in chemistry or in science. Do they influence how tricks are made up? Yes, they do. So there are classics of magic, which are, uh, are great and timeless. But there are also new things being developed um, all the time. Some people will do effects with iPhones and things like that and Rubik's Cubes. One important thing to, to know in magic is not the, uh, the technique that's actually important. The only thing that's important is the effect that it has on the audience. So when I'm in my lectures, I'll do some very technically simple things and some technically perhaps a little less uh, straightforward. Uh, but that's... Uh, not apparent to the audience in the slightest uh, and it's not important for the audience and uh, what's important for the audience is that they have a good time and that they enjoy whatever it is I'm, sh I'm showing so if I don't deliver it properly whether it's easy to do or whether it's difficult to do uh, then that wasn't a, a good thing and if I make them if I give them a thrill and a laugh and uh, they enjoy it or make them think uh, then that's exactly what I want to do. So you hold a record uh, of the, for the smallest knot in the Guinness Book of Records um, for your molecule 819. And is that magic as well or how did that happen? <laughs> the magic from that all comes from the students as so, uh, as so much of it, it does in our, our chemistry. Um, things like world records, uh, I grew up as a child watching um, programs uh, about world records uh, on, on the television. and. Uh, so I know the kind of impact that that can have with the, uh, with the general public um, and so that's the sort of thing when it's uh, either the world's tightest knot or we also have the world's um, most tightly woven um, uh, molecular structure, so the tightest woven sheets uh, that, are, and, um, that uh, have ever been made. And so those sorts of things I think are good for bringing uh, science again to the attention of the, uh, of the general public. So that's good fun for us and again great for the, uh, for the students to be able to tell their family and, pre uh, and, and friends, um, you know, I got my name in the Guinness Book of Records for uh, this bit of uh, amazing research that they've done. Okay, um, and in three words what do you think makes a good chemist? Um, uh, at my level, I would say it's leadership, um, uh, so uh, mentoring uh, and luck. What motivates you? Um, to be, um, to, to make sure that my, uh, my students and, uh, and then my uh, family are su uh, successful. Um, do you have an experiment that stands out in your mind, one of your own experiments? Yeah, one of the ones that I'm most proud of is the um, we repeated um, or we made in molecular form the Maxwell Demon thought experiment, which uh, showed the connection between information and uh, uh, and energy. So that was a thought experiment of, of James Clark Maxwell's, uh, dating back to 1857, and we actually did that in molecular form to demonstrate that how information could be used to drive 
chemical systems are away from equilibrium and that was cool. Okay. And um, is there a skill you would like to learn? What I always regret is not learning uh, foreign languages. We're, uh, uh, I don't want to make generalizations, but my generation in the UK were uh, languages weren't uh, as important as they uh, are now. Uh, and I really regret that. I speak some Italian and uh, a little bit of uh, uh, schoolboy French, but um, if I had my time uh, again, I would definitely try hard to learn a, a, a foreign language or two when I was younger. Um, do you remember a mishap in one of your experiments? Oh gosh, uh, I, I do. Uh, one of them was that one of my students uh, uh, was very close to um, making uh, the final step of, she'd made the final step of very long uh, chemical um, synthesis and uh, it was the coming up to the weekend, it was, she told me about it on a Friday, this was 20 years ago, and uh, uh, I couldn't wait for the results so I came into the lab over the weekend, columned her reaction mixture to try and isolate the, uh, the column uh, the, the product, I, I didn't get it quite pure, so I columned it again and again, didn't get it quite pure, so I columned it again and again. And by the end of the weekend, I'd completely lost all the material. Poor Jenny had nothing uh, left <laughs> and she had to repeat the whole synthesis again. So I've never been back in the lab since then. And my apologies to uh, the great Jenny Wong for, uh, for that. Um, where do you get the in inspiration for your work? Um, a lot of the inspiration comes from and the ideas come from the, uh, the people in our group. So what I try and do is to encourage an environment where people uh, uh, suggest ideas and come up with um, uh, uh, ideas themselves. They pitch them to me and I say no. Uh, and then they come up with a, a, another idea, bounce it around amongst themselves, uh, pitch it to me and I'll say no. And then once every 10 or 20 times, uh, one of them will have come up with some nugget uh, uh, of genius that's, uh, that's in there and so we'll take that nugget, we'll brush off the dirt, polish it up, have a look at it, bounce it around amongst uh, each other in the group and have a look and see if it looks like it's fool's gold, we'll throw it away and if it looks like it might be a nugget of, uh, of a precious metal then we'll go after it and that's how many of the ideas in our group come from. It's a nice picture. And when I look at your molecules, I always think there is also, you're coming from a picturesque point of view, is that correct? I, I have a vision of, um, uh, of molecules in, um, and we try and make molecules that are just as complex as they need to be to show a particular point. So it's quite minimalist. And I think that the aesthetics of the molecules that we make are, are important uh, as, as well. Um, and uh, yeah, so th that's definitely the way I think. I think yeah. mm -hmm. We are at the OICOMS conference in Dublin. Um, what do you think of a European or this format of European conference? You know, it's a, it was a, a real honour for me to uh, receive um, this award from the journal German Chemical uh, Society. And also it's great to have um, that in uh, Dublin as part of the UCHEMS uh, conference, uh, because of course we're uh, eight years now since the, uh, the, the, the Brexit uh, uh, referendum and I've always considered myself a, um, a, a strong uh, Euro European and actually this in-out question uh, that uh, uh, the British uh, faced in 2016, I like the analogy of, um, that was uh, uh, talked about at the time that it's a, a little bit like uh, the in-out question that you have with a cup of tea uh, do you leave the bag in or do you take it out? And it's a, a, it's a difficult uh, question because if you leave the, uh, the tea bag in, the whole cup of tea gets stronger, uh, but you, it might appear that the bag becomes uh, uh, weaker, but actually it's part of something that is going stronger and uh, uh, stronger. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you take the, uh, the bag out uh, immediately, uh, the tea uh, is weaker and the bag goes straight in the bin. And that's really how uh, I feel about uh, European cohesion and, uh, uh, and, and chemistry. And um, you said in the beginning that you're interested in the general public, that they understand chemistry. Um... Yeah, I mean, we, we're really lucky that we get to 
do the job that we do, uh, paid for by, from either taxpayers, euros or pounds in my, uh, my case. So I think that there's a huge responsibility on us to, uh, uh, to, to justify that to the, to the general public and also to inspire the next generation uh, coming through. So almost all the, um, the professors that I know went to do chemistry because they had brilliant high school teachers. Uh, and so anything that we can do to help uh, teachers inspire the next uh, generation of school kids that are going to be the next scientists, that's got to be a great thing. The more that people uh, understand the way that the world really is, mm. rather than superstitions or um, uh, false uh, uh, facts or fake news, uh, the better decisions voters will make in the uh, uh, when they come to the voting booth and uh, the better society it will be.